Welcome to Illuminate, uh, discussions on research in teaching and learning, and we're here to talk about SOTL, or the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. I'm Bruce McKay, I teach in the School of Liberal Education, and I'm a teaching fellow. I'm Hans Jochen Wieden from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and I'm interested in um, alternative modes of instruction and experiential learning, and I've received an Distinguished Teaching Award from the University of Lesbridge. H.D., what, uh, what sort of alternative teaching methods then would you use or part of your teaching toolkit in chemistry and biochemistry? Yeah, so classic teaching involves classroom teaching and I think um, that classroom teaching mode is one mode of instruction that, that is able to provide um, theory and, and factual information. But I think it's super important for the students to get engaged in the subject matter. And that's a little bit of more challenging in, in, a, in, in a chemistry classroom because of just the science and the, the, the safety and the security matters around that. Uh, but the concepts are very abstract and you know it's often difficult. I mean you see this when you ask your when your parents ask what you're doing in your in your studies and they say, well I'm gonna purify a clear liquid and I'm gonna pour it into a clear liquid and it's gonna be two microliters of it and then I know. It's very, very non. And that's and that's actually not necessarily what we're doing. You're actually doing you're engaging in, in, in the topic and you're you're learning manual skills as well, how to purify them and, 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 and learning about how what you're learning integrates in great picture is also part of the profession and, and, and the skill set mm -hmm. that we're learning. Mm -hmm. And often that's not taken care of, not to the point in the, um, in the classroom and fa fails, to, fails to, ex to excite the students. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do and what I think is super important, it's particularly in, that, in such, such, such a discipline, is to engage the students directly in, in a subject matter and a um, couple of ways to do this is like as we do we're, we're, we're training skill sets in, in the lab as lab skills but we also try to get the students engaged in, in larger projects so one of the things that, that I like to do is for instance have the students work on, 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 on research topics outside of the classroom like for instance I, you might have heard about the iGEM mm -hmm. team that we are running for quite some while and, and I think that that is a great great way of practicing the skill set that you have in a self-guided learning environment where the students have the ability to decide themselves how they're going to proceed their, 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 their scientific inquiry, how they develop the project. And what I like very, very much about that, and that's going to be a question I'm going to ask you later, is how, does, how, how the social impacts of the technologies or the, um, the values that they're creating by doing and developing new techniques, how they impact the society. And, and then the question that I would like to ask you is how do you see the role of liberal education in that kind of ex, you know, alternative, uh, um, alternative instruction style mm -hmm. and how would you see that liberal education can manifest itself for instance in the new transdisciplinary building, the science building that we're building? Mm. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, you know, first off, I think I see some similarities in, in some ways in liberal education and with the kind of innovative sort of hands-on teaching experience that you're describing because I think in liberal education we feel very much also that the best way or an important part of learning has to be active, has to involve um, hands-on. It's not in a wet lab, it's not in the techniques of doing the lab work, that sort of thing, but it's in taking a text or an idea and discussing it, uh, coming up with alternative arguments, examining the cases that have been made for or against a different point of view. So essentially developing the critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. which then are vital and which cut across all the disciplines at university. That's correct. So I think in that way, there's that strong connection between liberal education and the s social sciences, the humanities, the fine arts even, and the sciences is in areas like critical thinking, right? Where students learn how to construct a solid, logical, sound, a strong argument, if it's in you know an analysis of an English text, that's just as valuable as it is. I, in I think there's basically no difference. I mean, you know, in terms of you have to, you get a data set back, and you have to interpret all the data points that you have, yeah. and not just the ones that you like. Okay, yeah. and that's the same approach here, too, right? And the same thing is for value generation in, like, in bioethics and whatnot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then those skills that are learned are. Uh, and developed and practiced and improved uh, with feedback and correction and uh, um, you know the social aspects of teaching right um, those are transferable not just within disciplines in the university but outside in the real yeah. world in work yeah I, I like that because we what I, for instance I've, I've quite 
the, the lab enterprise going. But, but what I think is very important in the lab enterprise, in, in the lab, is that the people are able to teach and to be taught. Mm -hmm. And that is an interesting, uh, that's also a transferable skill, right? Because, Absolutely. I mean, we have often the undergrads coming in and the graduate students supervise them. And that is a, that's a new mode of learning for them because they have to teach the others and anticipate where, what kind of mode of instruction, how they con communicate the information, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then help them to construct that argument, let's say, how do I interpret my data, right? Mm. Yeah. So y you mentioned the iGEM. Yeah. And so there, you're getting involved with students before they actually come to university. So we actually have two iGEM teams, one collegiate iGEM team and a high school iGEM team. And I think that's a very powerful um, um, tool. So, I mean, from the, I mean, we're running iGEM teams since 2000, I don't know, since 11 years, let's put it that way. Then otherwise, I would date myself. Um, for 11 years, we have high school teams since six years. What we have seen is that the high school students continue on into the collegiate team and then further on. Um, the important thing of having a high school team is because um, early in, 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 in school they start learning about different career paths and what they can going to do later on. And it forms a community of, um, I always call it community of practice because they have, they have people, they, there's a group and the, the high school team is actually formed from all high schools in Lethbridge. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, this is Winston Churchill or just for a matter, it could be any other school, right? Um, so there are a group of students from all schools that get together and work together on that project within the university framework together with actually in, in, in a lab that's related to my, uh, it's close to my research lab and together with the collegiate iGEM team. So that already integrates the students into, like the high school students into the collegiate program. And a lot of collegiate iGEM um, members are supervisors on the high school team or become members later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they learn, I mean, a great example, I don't, we have recently had a student that went through the whole high school, collegiate, graduate school route. And as a graduate student here in the university, he is supervising the um, high school team and, and is part of the collegiate team and is now, and, and, and developed a um, dual use like bioethic framework to address certain technologies the students develop in the lab. And I think that's a great, yeah. great indication for self-guided learning yeah. how that, that, that prepares the students for thinking outside of the box and in, in, in assessing other, uh, yeah. uh, uh, or applying methodologies from outside of their own discipline label right. to attract or to, to solve problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's that it, yeah, it, and it's another example how it's not just classroom learning no, exactly. and theory and and but it's it's practice and it carries over into the classroom sure. because the skill sets that they're going to be learning that for instance asking the question I mean have you not ever been in a classroom where somebody asked a question where you say yeah I should have thought of that yeah. right and I you know that enables and, and enriches the, the teaching environment absolutely. in the classroom yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah so again you know in in our um, uh, liberal education class, especially at the introductory level. So uh, I've been involved in teaching it at, in the high school as well in a dual credit format with our, our liberal education 1000 class. And it has what we call a lab component, right? And mostly for critical thinking skills. It's fun to see the students fine tune what they already have is maybe some skepticism, mm -hmm. uh, some caution about accepting everything that they hear or, or read, um, beginning to um, fine tune the way to make arguments and then they, they in dialogue with each other uh, and in teams and in, in project work, right, even improve those, those skills. So when they come to university then from, from this high school experience, they already feel more comfortable with the university environment. This they they settle into their classes. They they think to themselves. They have some confidence. Hey, I've done this. I know how this works. And then yeah, it's exciting as well because in our model as well, more senior students who have been through our courses can come back. Do and they be, do that? Yeah, they yeah. come back as tutor tutorial leaders, um, in a similar sort of way and guide yeah. and, and facilitate the discussions with with smaller groups of the younger students. So, yeah, it's a, it's. Um, and it, it, I think it enables them to see what the academic world is like. Um, but again, they're developing all sorts of transferable skills, which uh, don't apply just in the academic world, but which... One, one of the interesting skills they learn is project management, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because they actually work on a, on, on a self-guided gu guided problem, right? Whereas when you go through the normal instruction mode, or even in high school, that's very, very... 
uh, schooled, right? Yeah. You know, they know what they'll be told to work on, right? I, yeah. I, I don't know if that's probably happening as well, right? Yeah, yeah some of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's fantastic. So um, let me ask about the um, uh, your iGEM projects also have an international component, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that must be pretty exciting for the students. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, we, we um, as part of the of part as part of the competition, competition the students um, have a final jamboree in uh, Boston. So we actually ah, okay. have to fly part of the. Well, we try to fly the whole team to Boston, have them compete, and the competition is huge. It's like a uh, last year we had over three hundred and fifty teams worldwide participating in the competition, and f meeting in that jamboree. Right there's like three thousand people in that, and like students in the, in that conference center, which mm -hmm. is it's an amazing atmosphere. Right mm -hmm. and. Um, I think what, what the students find very, very, of course, they want to go to Boston. That's a fantastic mm -hmm. trip, right? You mm -hmm. know, me too. Every year I want to go to Boston too. That's fine. The exchange to see, like, like you know, their poster is suddenly next to somebody from Chile. And they got right. to talk to them about their science, yeah. their problems, their career paths. Yeah. And um, Canada has a relatively, um, a relatively good standing in participation uh, over the years um, compared to other countries. Yeah. Um, so they, they meet people from, from all over Canada as well, sure. and form relationships within Canada, yeah. which, is, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And so that gets to that other aspect uh, that you mentioned about this kind of collaborative learning, teaching and learning, that it's not just a one-way delivery of information pro pro from professor down yeah. to students, but they're learning as well from each other. That, that's yeah. true. And yeah. what, what, what makes that very powerful is the fact they're less afraid of failing than when, when they're learning from me, I would say, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, so. Yeah, and there aren't marks attached to it. No, that's correct. But yeah. at the same time, they're in, in, a, in an environment where they're able to compare their work and see what everyone else is doing and even participate in, in a competition. Is that right? I mean, yeah. they. This is a competition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's so, the clear skills. I mean, this is, I, I always call that, it's, it's, like, it's a team sport. Right. It's, I, you have to, it's, I think you can totally compare it to a team sport discipline, right? Yeah. We have a team, we d the team decides how. How, what kind of game plan they're going to have, who's going to do what, who's mm -hmm. going to work on the uh, fundraising component, who's going to work on the science component, who's going to be in the lab, mm -hmm. and who's going to be, who's going to be repre representing it because they're going to have, um, so for integrative and for instance, um, liberal ed is, f f the, the fact that the competition is not only done on the science output, right? right? So I mean, you know, we have to fly the people, so it, er, each team costs about $40,000. They need to come from somewhere, right? So there's a huge, huge fundraising component to this. So they have to write grants, they have a business plan and whatnot. But they also demonstrate their um, research output as an oral presentation, as a poster presentation, on the ground talking to their other colleagues and on a website. So they maintain a website, right? Yeah. So those are all, all skills that, I mean, at, at the core is the fact that you understand that you cannot be, or that life is not about one trick ponies, right? right? Basically, so you have to integrate these kind of things. Also, you have to provide certain information to one of the subgroups at one point in time so that they're up in time and these kind of things. Right. And I think learning that on the high school level, I mean, we have had high school students in as young as grade nine. Yeah. And I mean, you know, they're in, they are a little bit overwhelmed with that, but since they're in that team and they look after each other, they're going to be carried and they should come back the next year. Yeah. And we have this um, article in, in Nature Biotechnology yeah. from, I don't know, last year or something, where it gives you a little bit of, of metrics around yeah. how, how, how the students feel about that. And yeah. I was talking to Doug Ord, who helped with, yeah. with, the, with the statistics of that, and when we sent out a survey and we got a response rate to the survey to the participants of that high school team at around 50%. I was very disappointed because I know I expected something like 80% or mm -hmm. something like that. And that was all over the place. You know, if you get 50% return, yeah. that's amazing, right? Yeah. And so yeah. it gives you a little bit of a feeling how, how engaged the students actually are and that there's some, yeah. some history in this, right? Yeah, and we yeah. sent this out to all uh, high school teams in the province, so it's not just a lesson. Ah, okay. Team, right? Okay. Yeah. So this is interesting research then. On, so you, I mean, you know, part of our teaching practice then is to is to think, hmm, this would be a good idea. I want to try this. <laughs> How do you measure and, that? And you and you have a gut feeling maybe yeah. that this is successful. Yeah. But when you're you're able to design a questionnaire and actually get some some feedback from students then that you can look at. Um, so what exactly did uh, did you find then from your research in the? The community, the community of practice is the me most pro um, most prominent positive feedback in that right. because they find identity in that group, right? And right. I think that might have to do with the science piece. That science often 
is, or natural sciences, what I mean, often it is perceived as a singular kind of person activity, right? Mm -hmm. You are, I mean, look up scientists on Google, you're gonna get all those kind yeah. of weird people, right? Yeah. And, um, and you know, I think at that point in time, students realize that that's actually a group endeavor, and that's a social activity, right? Yeah. And I think that is overwhelming, or like positively overwhelming for them at that point right. in time. The other interesting feedback is, did it, I mean, we also asked the question, does that influence your career choice? Mm -hmm. And that is a, I mean, you should look at the statistics. I mean, they're either 100, 90% positive or 90% hated, right? Um, but for instance, career choice is one of those things that I really think is very, um, which stimulates what that high school engagement stimulated. They yeah. actually thought about career paths that they didn't think about at that at the time yeah. when they joined the team, right? Yeah. And I think that is one of the yeah. positive outputs, yeah. right? Because I mean, we see them in the, in the university. Career paths usually have been decided on, right? They're going to be med school. They're not going to be med school, or what they're going yeah. to be. In my case, it's most, mostly that, yeah. um, because often, and I have learned that from talking to them, is lack of alternatives, right? Right. And um, so, yeah. 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 See, I have a, I have a sense that uh, uh, myself, that career paths are often um, less sort of well-defined in reality than they are, uh, you know, ideally, especially for a young person who, who envisions coming to university, um, coming out with a degree that is, is going to set them up for a, a clear path. Mm -hmm. uh, and my feeling is that that tends to be... Um, maybe not mythology, but uh, tends to be less regular than uh, we might like it to be. So I, I feel that, again, the skills of liberal education um, and the skills of critical thinking and communication and all of the things that your students are experiencing are those transferable skills yeah. that it doesn't matter what career you end up in or how you many times you change your career over your lifespan. You've learned things and abilities and practices that are going to make you successful no matter where you go. And I think that that is true. And that, that, that well, I I like I like to think of that that we are not giving them just degrees. We're giving yeah. them career options, right? Right, options. And yeah, we're helping them with that. And um, I have to say, for my own career, I I started as a chemist, right? And at the same, well, actually, I should start at high school. At high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I I knew what well, that was not true, but I had a but I couldn't make up my mind if I should study philosophy or chemistry. Right. Okay. And my decision for my career path was the paycheck average. Okay. Because both <laughs> of them were ex extremely cool, but I made my decision on the chance of making money later on. And okay. that where I'm from, basically, if you have a chemistry degree, you have a job. Period. Right. 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 And so I started chemistry, but I took philosophy on the same side. So I have two years of, so I basically have a, an undergrad in, in philosophy, right? Yeah. And I never completed it because in high school I didn't take Hebrew and I, my Latin wasn't that good, so I didn't yeah. want to learn another language, so yeah. I decided, nah. And then at that point I decided to go into biochemistry, which is dif again differently, right? And yeah. um, and then, you know, now, now I'm here, okay? Yeah. But the, the point is, whatever I've done, in philosophy was super instrumental to how I think about problems today, right? Sure. I mean, the whole logic piece, yeah. very, very yeah. interesting, right? Or the, the ancient philosophers, yeah. absolutely, ancient Greek philosophers, super interesting in yeah. terms of how, 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 how perception of what you see or like how you label it will make you make decisions, yeah. right? And I think that's a transferable right. skill. And absolutely. I think it, it shaped yeah. my thinking and how I do research yeah. today, yeah. right? My story is somewhat Similar, not quite as, as uh, uh, my choices were much wider. I started at the University of Lethbridge in music, of all things, um, but then switched to anthropology and then into religious studies, and um, that's where my PhD is in religious studies. But um, the skills of, you know, realizing that um, our beliefs, our ideas, our values, our norms, are the great insights of human civilization have a past and um, un understanding that past and how things came to be. And how the concept see, was formed, How right? the concept was formed, yeah. right, uh, then fuels, um, you know, my understanding of everything personally, but also fuels the way I'm trying to encourage students to see, okay, it's, you know, you don't have to learn, or you shouldn't learn just the way things are now, but you need to learn how we got here, because that's going to help you think about how you want to yeah. go in the future. Yeah. Yeah. My example always is, you know, we talk about a river, right? That's a piece in flux, right? Yeah. But when you think about it, it's a solid, it's, it's, a, it's a permanent piece. It's not. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. So, like, for, that's that's a conceptuality that you have to teach, right, yeah. and that you have to be aware of. Yeah. And that flexibility in thinking is is indeed a transferable skill that also in, empowers, for instance, breaking down barriers in in labeling or empowers you to do lifelong learning. Right. And not saying I have a degree; these are the terms. That's how it's going to be for the next sixty years of my life. Yeah. Right. Sometimes I've experienced students who um, seem um, that they would be happiest just being told, okay, here are the facts you need to know, and I'll test how well you know those facts, and then we're done. Um, do you find sometimes that there's some resistance to suit? Now, I think in the iGEM programs, you're, you're selecting, or the some of the self-selecting yeah, process. Yeah. Some of the students yeah. who are attracted to that are yeah. the are the yeah. very eager students, yeah. um, and so you maybe don't have the same sort of resistance to collaborative learning or to seeing transferable skills or to crossing the usual disciplinary boundaries. But when you do find that resistance, or do you find that resistance? I do find ever? that resistance. How do, how do you how do you um, try to encourage students to see beyond that? I think the resistance is based on lack of practice. It's not, you're not born like, I don't want to know, right? right. It's just, you know, you're, 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 you don't have, you're, you're afraid of, um, because you're approaching an, uh, an unknown area or an un uncharted land when you're making, when, you, when you're pushing beyond the boundary. So what, what in my case, what a student hate mo most about my exams is that I'll give them experimental data or, right. uh, you know, and they can answer that question. The whole concept of, I don't care if the answer that you're giving to me is right or wrong, as long as you can tell me how you derived or you, how you ended up with that answer and the reasoning is okay, <laughs> and it fulfills all the data that you have, then you know, then that's okay. Yeah. That is a leap of faith. You yeah. have to jump and, 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 and um, so you need a skill set, one thing. Yeah. You, need, need, um, um, you need to be strong enough to actually make decisions, okay, I'm gonna, I think that's best, I'm gonna build my argument based on this argument because that's mm -hmm. the better of the four or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that self-conscious, you need to build, that's a practical, you know, you have to have failures yeah. on that, you know how to overcome them yeah. and build, and, and we don't practice that too often enough, yeah. right? Because it's it's vague, the assessment is difficult, yeah. right? And I'll see this when when, when I will when I mark these, 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 these questions, right? You know, they open up a lot of discussion, why did I get only four marks out of five, right? right? Because, you know, it was not like, and whatever, and you have to discuss that with them, yeah. right? Um, and that's challenging on the instructor, and I don't, and. I, have to, I, I try to minimize these situations because I mean they're they're challenging situations mm -hmm. with the students. They become can become personal in that kind of thing because you're talking about thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no factual thing. I cannot point my finger in the textbook on page five. That's the word you should have used. Right. Okay? So that is a final argument, but yeah. the other one is not, right? Yeah. So um, the student hated when they're answering, and the, and the instructors like myself hated when they actually have to mark those things, right? right? Yeah. And so I think we don't practice that enough, yeah. and that's why these alternative modes. Are yeah. super interesting yeah. because they are not marked. They practice all that, yeah. and they're in, and they're in a peer environment, right? Yeah. And they get assessed by their peers, and that helps to to lower the barrier of doing that. And I I, I, I wouldn't I don't have done the math to it, but the, the iGEM students that I have in my classes, they do better on those questions sure. than others don't. Sure, do, right? Yeah, but that might be with the personal relationship. I don't. Well, know. no, I wouldn't be surprised. I I, I mean I've done. I'm, I'm interested in the, the, these, these boundaries that you, you use that term. I've used the term thresholds. Okay. And uh, it's this shift in thinking that has to take place. And many times that, that provides a, a very strong barrier for students, a leap of faith you, you, yeah, you mentioned, is, right? right yeah. um, and, and how then do you help students cross over that boundary? How do you cross over that threshold? How do you make that leap um, safely? Um, and I think the notion that collaborative learning, talking to each other, I, in my experience as well, that has been key in helping students realize that they, they uh, you know, that everyone else is in a very similar situation yep. and they can learn from each other's yep. experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask um, about the new building, the oh, new yeah. science building. Let's talk about new building. <laughs> Be because it seems to me that the physical space um, where learning occurs, if it's straight rows and fixed seats listening to someone talk, it's very difficult to have this sort of collaborative work environment, right, where you're experiencing what you're learning. So how does the new building, how will the new building um, help? 
Well, okay, that's a good thing, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a oh, I, I don't know. Um, difficult, we will see. Okay, there are a couple of features that I really like about that building that, that might make that happen. One of them is transparency. So we still, of course, have the, the tiered seats, yeah. and which um, is a necessity of class size, for instance, right? If you have smaller groups that, that I've taught before, I can do a group environment, I can bring a teapot in, and we make tea first, and blah, blah. That's one way of breaking those barriers. But I mean, you, if you have 20 students and up, then it becomes yeah. more difficult, right? Uh, but transparency, um, is important. I think part of that peer learning is seeing other people learn, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, even if you're in a group that is not super interactive in a, in, a, in, a, in a grouped experience learning, you see another group that's going crazy on that question. They're excited. They're having fun, or they're they're playing with something that you don't understand. That sparks your interest, right? Mm -hmm. It sparks your interest. In maybe I want to do this. Maybe what what's different and whatnot. And I think we can capitalize on that like, you know, visual mm -hmm. integration in the new building. So for instance, what it does is the co, the co localization of all undergraduate labs on one floor with transparency, like you can actually see into the lab mm -hmm. with, with the glass, you will see your, your, your peers practicing a technique that is part of their lab skills or whatever it is, right? But mm. you can see them. In the past, we would not. The University Hall is a linear piece, right? Which is great in terms of co-localizing stuff, but it is still linear. If I'm at, which or where I am, an E end, I'll talk, don't talk to people in B, yeah. right? And I don't see them. And, um, and I even see them less when there is no food catering during the summer. Yeah. That's my criticism here and now. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, the point is, in, 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 let's say now you have a big floor where all like biochem, biology labs, uh, chemistry labs are cooked and you, the students work, walk through it and can, see, do, can yeah. see other people practicing this. I think that helps to break down the barrier of like, you know, how you name your discipline to what are you actually doing. And they will realize that there are certain overlaps in things that you're doing sure. or they, they come out of the classes at the same time, they collide in the hallways, talk about that. And I think that, I mean, the, the greatest power, the greatest capital that we have as our institution is the student body. Mm -hmm. Because they are turning over, they are going to bring, they are the innovators in this, and they are the more flexible, uh, mobile in terms of that, because they are running around in the building because of the instruction. Mm -hmm. whatnot. I only run around into the building if I want to go home or to Starbucks or something like that, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. I, have, I have particular passes, but because of the instruction, they have to run around. So they are going to be the lifeblood of the building, because mm -hmm. they are going to be on that floor, then they are going to go up wherever they advanced. Um, um, teaching is, they're going to be, uh, anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm digressing. But I think the, the point is that we can see this. So, you know, we, we can work on, by, by, yeah, I think that that's the case. You can see other people practicing a, a different technique mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily put a name label on them, right? right. And that's, that's one of the, uh, the, yeah. uh, the boundaries that we face. And I think we can break this yeah. down with that building, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, from the liberal education perspective, I think it would be fantastic as well to have, uh, you know, I know in m much of your, your biotechnology stuff, there are, there are ethical issues. Oh, yeah. Right? So to be able to have that mixing extend uh, beyond... How would you want to do that? Yes. <laughs> I'm super excited yeah. about this. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a huge potential in that. Yeah. Well, I think... So here's a, an idea then, yeah. uh, maybe we can collaborate. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, I found that, uh, you know, using a seminar topic that is an issue, a particular problem, so we might think of perhaps genetic modification of food for certain attributes. That's something that has obvious scientific um, aspects, but certainly social oh, yeah. aspects, political, economic. Uh, philosophical ethics, and that topic can serve as a location where you not only bring transdisciplinary science teams together, but also disciplines from across the spectrum of the university, I think, to talk about the issues there. A um, little harder maybe to come up with projects, that, uh, but the students can... I, I don't can, know. I mean, yeah. we had... Um, I mean, when two years ago I taught Biochem 3300, which is metabolism and bioenergetics, right? And one of the major challenges is that although, like learning a new language in, in like 24 hours, basically, right? You know, you need to learn the words and then you need to work to learn the grammar and then you have to do. So it's, it's very hard. I mean, you can choose two ways of teaching this, either by just memorizing everything or trying to point out the connections, right? Because I mean, the, how this thing works evolved. Mm 
So there have to be connections between it came from A to B, right? So you know, and nature is lazy, that's what I always say. There's only so many solutions nature has to a certain problem. Mm -hmm. So if you understand the principles of laziness, then it actually cuts down an amount you have to memorize, right? So in order to learn that, you have to engage with that. What, what, have, what we have done basically, what we, which is basically similar to, to an AD&D game. Like, you know, you have rules and you have to play with what you have, yeah, right? Yeah. So we, we built together with um, New Media students a game around this, right? And the students had to go, my class students had to go to the media, New Media class, the game development class, and explain to them how that game, what should be the rules. And they had to interact with them, okay? Mm. So that is a cross-teaching piece which is directly related to the instruction in the biochem class as well as in, in, in um, that class, right? And I think that's where that potential might, might yeah. lie. That one yeah. of the problems that in a lib ed class would be, for instance, you know, how do you, value, how do you assess a value that you're creating by a technology, right? Or right. the impact of a technology on, on an existing value set. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that can be a question within a lib ed class, for instance, that is then done by surveying or interacting with a science class, let's say. For sure. Don't, yeah. you, don't you think yeah. that is no, the integration think, piece yeah. that we could do for yeah. trans? Yeah. yeah. Um, because the, the, the students, I don't know for, for the students in lib ed, but the students, I would say, in, in the science classes are unaware of that because they are focused, not, not all of them, don't, don't no. get me wrong, but yeah. it's fundamentally you know, the first thing that comes to their mind is the fact, you know, I, I have this cool thing that I can build, right? The success of doing that is the first thing that matters, right? right. And then, you know, what are the implications for that? And um, yeah, yeah, it's a different thing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I, and I think that's where my philosophy background comes in. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think we are enabling technologies, and then we have to also do the assessment of that. Yeah, right? for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, I think. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think we have. <laughs> You know, we have so much in common, right, of course, as teachers, I, I think, you know, and, and trying to be, uh, to find innovative ways to help students learn these skills that are going to give them success. It's, yeah. To, to come back to that, what, how the building could help, right? So what I think, what the building has, it has very diverse, diverse rooms, right? And when we think of the building as a, as a confocal point, of what we're doing, it's located very well on the university, right? You know, mm -hmm. it closes the loop, it is very close to, um, but anyway, so it's located well, so we can actually have um, people move into that space, right? And do certain things if their right spaces are available. And we have very flexible spaces yeah. in the building, right? So we have large rooms, we have large lecture theaters, but we also have the outreach spaces, okay? We have seminar rooms and whatnot. I think if, yeah. if we try to do, for instance, I, my big vision, for instance, would be bringing, instructing, um, instructing, let's say, kines students in these spaces or um, students from health sciences in these spaces mm -hmm. to help them to understand what the technologies are that they're using. Because some of the technologies, for instance, health sciences that are used for us, like, you know, the PCR test for whatever disease you're going to be using, there is a scientific basis to that sure. that's developed actually there. So, I mean, that would be a great confluence, right? Yeah. And we, I mean, just for, from, from the point of booking or planning where people go and flow, I think we can do a lot of integration there. And if you think of the building as, an, as, a, as a confocal point, we might actually achieve this just, yeah. that's yeah. just the way you said, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a great idea. I'll, I'll work to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> How do we integrate education? I guess in a similar way, yeah. right? Um, you know, one of, I think, uh, you know, there of course, uh, um, um, experiential learning model is, is the professional semesters when students are out in the, in the, uh, the, the schools, but there must be other ways to introduce that sooner, perhaps. Uh, yeah, we'll have to talk to some people. Thank you. Thanks, HJ, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, yeah, sharing some of your thoughts and uh, experiences. It's, Really interesting, inspiring. Well, thank you for um, letting me say things that I probably shouldn't have said. But <laughs>